days ago, somebody relatively prominent said, uh, Bitcoin is bigger than the internet, bigger than the industrial revolution. Was that Tim Draper? And it's exactly what's happening with Bitcoin. Bitcoin. I, don't know why I, I don't know why I said anything about it. Bitcoin possesses all the attributes, not only of good money, but of supremely good money. But of course, it's not financial advice. Hey guys, welcome to a new podcast of Non-Financial Advice. We're here with our second episode about cross-chain communications. I'm again here with Eugene, our researcher, who is currently writing several reports about cross-chain comms. He's writing about bridges, liquidity pools, and a lot of uh, assets. But today we're here with Nomad. It's a bridge that's using optimistic uh, technology. And I'm very interested to talk about all the things going on in the ecosystem. Because it's a very busy week, uh, right, Prene? Yeah, it's it's an exciting time to chat. I know we had set up this call like a week or two ago. And then as of time of recording, uh, yesterday was the big Ronin hack, which I think is the, the Ronin Bridge hack, which is the biggest hack in all of crypto at this point. So I think we'll have a lot of juicy stuff to talk about, but I'll wait. I'll wait till we get into it later. Yeah, we'll probably uh, get into that later. And um, how are you uh, doing, Eugene? Because you've been writing a lot of uh, reports lately. So I wonder how is your week and how have you responded to like all the news with the hack? And also like uh, just a lot of things are going on in like crushing communications in general. Yeah, for sure. Like as, as like in my head, it's like the biggest problem currently facing DeFi. Like liquidity is like so fragmented. There's all sorts of, um, there's like a lot of activity, but the activity is fragmented as well. Like people like on one chain can't interact with like protocols on like every chain it's like the way they should be like you can't have a fragmented economy so like i've been deep diving into stuff like that but obviously the reports are still to come out and i'm sure we'll dive deeper into that into the like further into the podcast yeah exactly and um to start off uh, prene we've talked uh, a bit on telegram but i want to know more about you and how you got into crypto so please tell your story Totally. And, and I'll try and speed run through this because I've told it several times and I'm really keen to get into what Eugene brought up about around the fragmented economies being the core infrastructure issue that we're trying to solve uh, with bridges. But um, quickly about myself, um, I'm a chemical engineer by training. Uh, I cut my teeth working in a refinery. And then later on, I was um, a potato chip slicer at Frito-Lay, was working at their R&D division. Um, and really when, when, um, the Snowden leaks happened in 2013 was when I got more interested in tech, because in my mind, that was such a seminal moment in realizing that your human rights were, were, have always been at risk in the physical world, but now they were at risk in the digital world as well. And so, um, because I wanted to play a role in shaping what the outcomes there would be, I started, I started looking at software as something that was more compelling to me as a vocation. So I kind of switched my career. I, I became a software engineer, um, worked at several big companies. Um, and in 20, 2018-ish, I found myself um, getting tired of um, work, putting dog faces on people at Snapchat. Uh, I, was on the G, I was on the GeoFilters team, and I was spending most of my days figuring out how to sell GeoFilters to uh, big companies so that they could then like advertise on people's faces. Because there, there's like this saying, like so the most important real estate is somebody's forehead, right? So it just felt like a very depressing view of the world. And, and so I left that and I started figuring out, like, what do I do here? Um, and that's when I kind of fell into the crypto rabbit hole. Um, I was helping a friend organize a, a conference and started meeting some brilliant people in the space. Um, and one thing that really clicked with me was this idea of ZK Snarks. Um, I watched um, Isaac Meckler, uh, who's the CTO of uh, Coda at the time, but Mina Protocol now. Um, I watched a great presentation by him on zero knowledge proofs and snarks back then. And it just like, it blew my mind that there was this new primitive that could encompass not only data, but uh, computation in the form of like a proof or, or a digest, if you want to look at it that way. And so I reached out to the team. That was my first entry point into crypto. I worked at Mina for about a year. Um, doing DevRel there, and then uh, joined Celo after that. Worked uh, for two years at Celo uh, as a product manager, working on various protocol level uh, teams, including the blockchain team, cryptography, and the Bridges team. 
and that's when I really started getting more uh, invested in the multi-chain future and working on bridges. And so since then, um, I've left Celo and founded Nomad last year. Um, and with Nomad, we're trying to build a security first uh, cross-chain solution that can be deployed now. Because, I mean, touching back on the contemporary issue of the day, the three largest hacks of crypto have been bridge hacks now. And so it is very important that we figure out how to make these things secure when the market need for them has arrived. We, we cannot wait for header relays to be deployed everywhere because it takes time and a lot of engineering work. But we need something in the interim. And I'm hopeful that Nomad can play a role there. Uh, yeah, and um, I wondered, like, are there some things you have learned at Celo when working on bridges and blockchains in general that you still uh, use at Nomad, like some of the, maybe their ethos or their way of how they look at bridges? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I think what I learned from cutting my teeth on these layer one protocols, Mina and Celo, is the quality of engineering that goes uh, into the layer one protocol itself and at the infrastructure level. Um, I think most of the interest in crypto has come from people interfacing with it at the application layers, namely DeFi and NFTs, gaming, because that's what that's what resonates most with a user, which is something that I can touch and play with and feel. But really what powers all of these things under the hood is the infrastructure. It's the plumbing that the users don't see but they need to be reliable every day in order for them to be able to use their favorite products. And so I think that philosophically was the key thing I learned because I've spent most of my, all of my time in crypto working at the infrastructure layer. And so infra is very close to my heart and philosophically, I have understood the value of being security first. Um, if you tell somebody that a layer one is very fast and very cheap, but might break every day, they're like, well, I can't build anything on this. I have no... SLA is I have no guarantees on how this thing will support me, whether the the baseline primitives that we depend on are going to be there day to day when I need my application to serve 10,000, 100,000 million users, right? And so the same, the same thinking can be applied to bridges. The thing about bridges, though, is that it may be working perfectly one day, and then uh, six days later has a massive black swan event, right? And so we need to apply those same principles to prevent being rugged at the bridge layer as well. Yeah, I, um, I've read about it. And um, wh where I read it, it was kind of described as the interoperability trilemma, just as like you have this the trilemma with blockchains with scaling. You have the same trilemma with bridges, but it's a bit different. So could you like explain the issues that are currently there with like cross-chain communications and how people are trying to swap assets? So, um, yeah, I, I hope to uh, learn from you how you view that issue. Yep, happy to. Um, so I think there, there are several trilemmas. There's different, depending on how you're looking at it, there's different ways to think about the trade-off space between the things that people are building, right? And so the one that I think is useful to talk about is um, we work closely, uh, very closely with the team uh, called Connext that is building like a liquidity network and bridging layer that allows people to bridge assets very quickly and securely between chains. They are a natural complement to Nomad and, and we can touch more on why later. But um, Connect's founder Arjun has written a really great article touching on the interoperability trilemma where he calls out three main parameters uh, against which bridges um, uh, interoperability solutions can be weighed against, which are uh, trustlessness, uh, generalize, generalizability and extensibility. Sorry, I'm like stumbling on my words because there are too many syllables there. Uh, but really what this means is uh, if a bridge is trustless, it means like, how, like, do you have to trust somebody? Do you have to have faith in one or several counterparties in order to be able to use this thing? Generalizable means can it, can it send arbitrary state from one chain to the other? Can you make a state update on chain A and send it to the other? Then extensible simply means how easy is this thing to deploy everywhere, right? Because we need to connect all of these chains. Can we do it quickly and can we do it now in a, in a safe way? And so at each, each of these edges, there exists a different solution. Um, you can choose two out of the three and you end up at a different solution. So something that is generalizable and trustless 
is what I touched upon earlier, header relays like IBC. The key property that they lack, though, is extensibility, meaning it's very hard to take like one uh, version of it and then deploy it everywhere. You can see this is the case with Cosmos because the entire Cosmos ecosystem had to be built around IBC. If you don't use a Cosmos SDK to build your chain, if you have a different consensus mechanism, if you're not using Go, all of the tools don't work right out of the box, right? And so each of these edges has a different trade-off. I can go through all of them if we want to, but really what we're solving for is a bridge that is trust minimized, meaning that you can use it without having to rely on certain counterparties that can send generalized messages, meaning you can build an app that says GM from one chain to the other and, and not just be focused on token bridging. And then last is extensible. It can be deployed everywhere and quickly. That's kind of the holy grail. And with Nomad, I'm not going to say like we solved this whole thing. Like I, I think trade-offs are invariants that you're really pushing against each of these things and seeing where in that like trilemma do you want to play. But I strongly believe in the idea of the Pareto principle, which is that getting to 80% competence in something is quite easy. Getting the remaining 20% gives you diminishing returns. And so what Nomad has done is it says, hey, we're not going to try and be 100% at each of these three parameters, and nobody will be even if they're promising you that. But what we can do is we can get to 100% on one and maybe 80% on the others, right? And there's a great value in that because most of the time you're operating in a space where you don't need the full 100%. And so when I think about Nomad, I think about a trust minimized system that doesn't reach the security full trustlessness of an IBC, but does so well enough most of the time. And in the situations it doesn't, you have a fallback mechanism to protect yourself. Yeah, I mean, Eugene and I kind of talked about this with blockchains where a Bitcoiner will tell you Ethereum is not secure enough. An Ethereum user will tell you Solana is not secure enough. But at the end of the day, people will decide what they will use. Even if it's not 100% on each side of the trilemma, they will find something that's a bit in the middle or reaches a certain amount that's usable and secure enough, like we've seen with Ethereum. People are fine with using it. Although a Bitcoiner might tell you, yeah, it has not really solved the issue. Like it's still too centralized. And I mean, that's the reason we have got so many chains now because like like some chains are good for some things and other chains are not good at some, like for some applications. And um, so I fully believe in the like sort of multi-chain thesis that there's no one size fits all like um, solution for uh, like blockchain application. Um, so all these chains are necessary and it's the linking of them that we're sort of falling short on at the moment and sort of the crypto space and the sort of blockchain, uh, blockchain interoperability um, dilemma, basically. Yeah, and Eugene, do you also think that maybe with bridges, there's also not like one optimal solution? So maybe like we talked to TorSwap uh, and like about ThorChain in the last episode and they had like a completely different way of doing it than Nomad has. But maybe those two ways can coexist and like uh, help each other in certain areas. Like we'll soon dive in how Nomad does it. But I think that's kind of my thesis that we're not going to have one solution, but one solution will work better at some things than the other. So they're going to both exist in different places. Yeah, for sure. And like, I mean, like protocols like ThorChain, ThorSwap and stuff like that, like they're more on the sort of liquidity pool side of things. So like, uh, actually moving wealth from one chain to another, um, but it doesn't really solve the sort of communications issue um, as such. Uh, so that's where like other solutions like such as bridging um, come into it. Like, um, so like it's basically a decentralized exchange, but for any asset, like any, depend doesn't matter what chain it is, you'll be able to swap it to any other asset on another chain. And that is important in the multi-chain sort of um, infrastructure, but it's not the full story. Um, so like things will need to like the sort of bridge liquidity to the liquidity pool and bridging solutions and stuff like that need to live like in parallel because they solve different parts of the same problem. Exactly. And this kind of comes back to the trilemma as well, because what Eugene is calling out is that ThorChain and other liquidity network systems provide a valuable service, but they're not generalizable. Like the messages they send are very limited in scope to allow for like essentially 
it's it's a locking mechanism that allows for atomic swapping between chains, right? And so we believe we partner with Connext because we believe Connext has a very robust and secure solution. But at the end of the day, Connext does not allow users to send arbitrary state from one chain to the other. And so you can swap between assets, but you need something to be able to mint those representational or wrapped assets on the chain before you can swap into it. And I see this as a common misconception that people have, like particularly with the recent hype around Layer Zero and Stargate, there's a lot of like confusion amongst users that are like, Stargate has solved a major problem with wrapped assets. You don't need to wrap assets anymore. You can just swap into existing assets. But then the question is, how did those assets get there in the first place? They had to use a lock and mint bridge in order to get there. And your security is only as strong as that lock and mint bridge even if you're using that liquidity network layer, because that escrow risk that comes from locking that asset on one side and minting it on the other persists indefinitely. And so if you have a hack like we saw yesterday, and that uh, escrow function basically gets corrupted, then it doesn't matter if you swapped into it on the other chain, you've basically traded for worthless paper. And so we really need to distinguish between what I call settlement layer bridges, which do the locking and minting, and then the burning and unlocking the other way, and liquidity networks, which allow a user to bridge liquidity, but do not actually create new synthetic or wrapped assets on the other side. And I think certain projects take advantage of this confusion to make themselves seem more secure. But really, these are two parts of the same solution, which hopefully we can touch on later. But Nomad and Connext are kind of creating a modular approach where you can use both of these in concert. Uh, yeah, I think it would be good to like dive uh, deeper into Nomad itself now and like find out uh, what you're doing because uh, um, like if, if we go to your Twitter, you say we believe bridging is optimistic and that's uh, referring to like optimistic systems. So I would like to learn more about that and how like Nomad differentiates itself from other known bridges like Wormhole and yeah, the ones we just mentioned. Totally. So um, if we look, if we put aside Nomad for a second and look at all of the other uh, options for this settlement layer bridge that I just described, you'll largely see that there are two categories. Um, and a lot of this is covered in the article that Arjun wrote, and hopefully we can link that in the show notes so that people can read it, read it for reference later. But in the settlement layer bridges, there's largely two main verification models. There's native verification and external verification. Native verification is what, what IBC and other header relay-based systems do, which is that when I'm sending a message from chain A to chain B, I will have on chain B itself, I will have a light client contract for chain A that keeps the entire state of chain A fresh. And then anytime we submit a message on chain A, you can verify it trustlessly against the light client that is already deployed on chain B. This doesn't introduce any external party that needs to verify the messages because the validators of the underlying chains do all the work. The validators on chain A have to be honest in order for the light client state to be valid and then uh, vice versa going the other direction. And so this is the best way to do bridging between two different validator sets. But as mentioned earlier, it's not very extensible, meaning it's hard to build these systems in an efficient manner. They're hard to deploy. And on expensive chains like Ethereum, it can cost a lot to maintain the state on that light client, which is why we haven't um, seen the system work very well um, in certain pathways. They work well in certain environments like Cosmos, but outside of that, they don't do super well and they're hard to scale. Um, the other category is external verification, which means instead of verifying a message against a light client, you are basically relying on some set of people in the real world to say, okay, I saw Pranay deposit 1,000 USDC on Ethereum. Let's now mint this to Eugene on Polygon, right? And so th the, more, the most naive way of doing this is to rely on, on one person, is to say, I'll just trust Stan to do it. Stan yeah. organized this call. He's a good like, dude. Uh, oh, I would be like one validator saying, I trust Eugene and Pranay without having anyone else looking if what I'm saying is true. Exactly. But if somebody bribes you, Stan, now you can take my 1,000 USDC and say, you know what, Pranay actually didn't send it to Eugene. He sent it to me. He, he, was, he, was, he was planning to send it to me all along. 
And so that system doesn't work super well because, again, we lose the trustless property in that trilemma. What most systems have done, a lot of the validator-based constructions and multi-sig constructions out there, is they just throw more people at this problem. They say, instead of just having Stan, we'll clone 100 Stans, and as long as 67 of them you know, do the right thing, then we're okay. This um, is, um, at- to give you like an idea, this is what the Ronin Bridge did, right? Because they had multiple validators. But at the end of the day, you saw that they all got, or at least enough of them were compromised for the hack to happen. So although there were more, it wasn't enough. And it was also, a lot of them were owned by the same person as well. So it would be like me living together with those stands in one house. So we could all work together anyway. That's the big risk that stand one through a hundred all know each other and they can collude, right? So Throwing more parties at the problem kind of is, um, it is a valid approach if you really believe that these parties will never find a way to collude. And also that the system that they're running doesn't have one vulnerability that can hit all of them. So even if the hundred stands mean well, if you're all like using the same process and the process itself gets corrupted, then the system is at risk. So. What that brings us to is it brings us to why uh, what what is Nomad's design philosophy, which is instead of relying on a hundred stands and waiting for more people and throwing more bodies at the problem, we say, Stan, you know what? You're most likely uh, a really good guy. We trust you. But what we're going to do, we're just going to rely on you. We're going to rely on one stand. But what we're going to do is gonna, we're going to wait thirty minutes and put whatever you do in public visibility so that. Anybody in the world that is watching off-chain can submit a fraud proof, somehow say, hey, Stan this time is actually not doing the right thing. We need to stop him. And the good thing is because we wait 30 minutes or some amount of time, we can prevent the like any bad situation from happening because we've traded off a little bit of latency for the ability of one, as long as one honest person is watching to make the system safe. And so that is the crux of the optimistic model that Nomad uses. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's something that could, in theory, like have prevented the Ronin hack. Because right now, no one noticed that it happened, or at least that's what they're saying. Like, I don't know if they noticed it, or maybe they they didn't say it before. But um, if like your system was there, if someone would have noticed it during that time, they could have stopped the, the 600 million to be withdrawn. Because someone would have said, okay, this is not okay, that's not happening. Exactly. Though I think in this case, so Nomad right now from Ethereum to Moonbeam, for example, has a dispute window of about 30 minutes. Um, The interesting thing about the Ronin hack is it happened six days ago or seven days ago now, and nobody discovered it. And so that calls into the question of not only having the dispute window, but having strong observability mechanisms. So somebody like some type of dashboard or system that is able to see, oh, this amount of this transaction being bridged out is like two or three standard deviations above what is normal. Like either flag this with some human being if it's a custodial system or have a built-in circuit breaker or some type of thing that can leverage nomad a nomad style dispute window. And so this this calls upon the lacking of just the maturity in the space to have observability. But certainly your point is valid, which is that without some type of latency window, that thing, that message automatically gets propagated and confirmed on the destination chain and, you know, shit hits the fan, so to speak. Yeah, well, what are your uh, thoughts on this, uh, Eugene? Because you've probably read, like, tons of white papers of different solutions. And I wonder what your view is on, like, the, the one of Nomad. Yeah, for me, it's, like, it's kind of a case of, um, like, the accountability of the transactions. Like, it's... <laughs> I don't, like the the optimistic solution, like sort of like ideals, like um, you can you can confer, like get uh, it doesn't have to be like a trusted third party. It's like sort of a um, like any other party, like to sort of scrutinize any like goings on behind the scenes and like put a stop to um, any bad actors before they can act, kind of thing. And I, I just think it's like sort of. It's a perfect fit for bridging, to be honest, and um, I definitely think it's a good way to, of going about it uh, in terms of trying to improve the security of bridging, which, as we've seen, is 
um, severely lacking, like not only recently, but like with the wormhole hack and stuff like that. Yeah, and um, Prania, what are like any other ways you think bridging can be more secure? Like, um, you, you, I think you guys have read like a few threads about like good bridging too, about like how a bridge doesn't have to be the best bridge. Like, not, I mean, it has to be the best bridge, but it doesn't have to be the most secure way of bridging as long as it fits those criteria. So, um, together with optimistic, uh, like the optimistic systems. What are some other important aspects of Nomad? Like, how is it able to scale, so be able to get integrated everywhere? And um, yeah, what's like the usability as well? Is like the user experience good enough to be adopted? Totally. Yeah, I think the core of the protocol is the optimistic mechanism that uses fraud proofs. But I think other important things that have to be considered, um, one thing, for example, is fungibility of token representations. So with the token bridge itself, one of the really cool things Nomad does under the hood is it maintains a token registry where on any chain, say we bridge to Ethereum, from Ethereum to Polygon, um, there's a token registry that says it maps the canonical address of, say, USDC on Ethereum to the representation address that Nomad deploys on Polygon. Now, if you move that from Polygon to Avalanche, for example, that pointer just changes. It points the USDC. Now it's keyed. It still remains keyed by the canonical address on Ethereum, but that pointer has changed to the representation address on Avalanche. And so that was a very technical way of describing the very valuable feature of Nomad has path independence. So if you use something like IBC, you always have to use the same route to get the same wrapped asset. And so what a lot of protocols in, in the Cosmoverse have done is they've all they said, whenever you're trying to go from, say, Osmosis to Terra, you always go Osmosis, Cosmos Hub, and then Terra. Yeah. I don't know if that, that is the canonical route, mm -hmm. but I'm just making it up as an example that yeah, you always have you to mean. follow that route. It's just like with token swaps with an aggregator that the aggregator would only know one way to swap your token and there is no other way to do it. Exactly. And if you, in this case, if you go another way, those tokens are no longer fungible. And so one of the cool features and design choices Nomad makes is regardless of what route you take, the tokens are fungible. So you can go directly from Ethereum to Avalanche or from Ethereum to Polygon to Avalanche, and the USDC that shows up will be fungible with any other route that you've taken. Now, this is a very good user-facing feature, but it has a security implication, which is every chain that is within that is connected via the Nomad token bridge now can corrupt the system, right? So like if you hop uh, from, from Ethereum to Ronin to Polygon, if Ronin gets rugged, um, the Ronin network gets rugged, then your assets on Polygon are also susceptible, right? So I want to be very clear that like every design decision that we make has trade-offs. It's not like we get this for free and that the IBC designers just made a mistake. They, the IBC designers made a very conscious choice that the zones are the unit of sovereignty, that they should decide what other zones they want to potentially interface and do commerce with. That is a very valid kind of way of looking at the world. The way we look at the world is that all of the chains that are enrolled within the Nomad Token Bridge ecosystem are kind of within the same coalition and that governance can be used to manage the links between them. If any of them notice that one chain is starting to falter or have risk, then that's, that system can be voted out using governance and the dispute window can be used as a way to act as a buffer for any message that that chain has sent. And so there's the benefits of this is now you gain fungibility between all of these chains that are linked uh, and you don't have to maintain these routes manually. But there is that very real trade-off and I think it's worth calling out. Yeah, um, it's but very basically, good that you mentioned it. Like a lot of people often do mention the pros, but uh, in a podcast, they kind of leave out the cons of some of their uh, decisions. That's the w that's the way people do it in this space because there's there's too much noise and and you can basically get away with not like you know being accountable for what you're building because it takes it takes a lot of time and investment in order to understand what's working in this space. I know like Eugene is probably doing a ton of research every day and despite being at the bleeding edge, even researchers and builders like us feel behind the wheel often. So I think it's like it's impossible for any one person 
And as an industry, we have to do two things, which is one, the people who are trying to build honest and good things in this space should be very clear about what they're putting out there, including the, uh, the, the negative uh, parts of the designs that they've chosen. And two, as a whole, we need to call out people that are not forthright and using that ambiguity as a way to advance their business needs. I think in the long run, that affects all of us negatively. So I, I just want to be really clear that we care about the 50, 100-year vision and building technologies that will last beyond our lifespans. So we're not in it for the for the quick buck in six months. So we're willing to talk about the the bad things about Nomad. It's it's part of the process. I think like all, already one clear sign that you're doing that is the fact that Nomad doesn't have a token like or like an IDO like at a very early stage because that's often like one of the signs that someone is kind of in it to raise money while with a bridge I often don't really see the use of a token early on yet. Agreed. And um, yeah, one thing I also want to talk about are the integrations because I think that's like very relevant to the people listening. So currently you're, if I'm correct, integrated with Moonbeam. You have announced the uh, EVM mouse, uh, Milcomida is mentioned and Ethereum. Are there any ones that I haven't mentioned? Yeah, so those are the chains that we're on right now. We're currently deployed on Ethereum, Moonbeam, and Milkameda. Um, and then we're planning to deploy on Evmos shortly, as soon as Evmos is able to relaunch. Um, we've chosen these chain to work with these chains because we believe in the teams. Like a lot of our philosophy is we want to work with projects where people are also building for that 50, 100 year vision. And I feel that when I talk to the Moonbeam team, Milkameda and, and Evmos teams as well. Um, we have several other teams working with, and we also want to roll out to a lot of the chains that uh, have a lot of liquidity and developer interest. So that's all coming pretty soon. Like one of the focuses of our current engineering sprint is to make our deployment process like super easy so that we can just like one click deploy and basically um, be, on, be on these chains within a matter of hours, right? So um, stay tuned. This is one of the few places where I'll, I'll be like soon TM, but we are going to be on a lot more chains and, and we're pretty excited about expanding Nomad's reach. Uh, yeah, Eugene, you've uh, researched the Moonbeam quite a lot as well, I think. So like, what's your general view of uh, Nomad? I think what I also find interesting, like Polkadot and Cosmos, they're both like trying to solve the same issue with um, um, like chains that are um, solving a specific, uh, like DAP specific chains. So what's your view on like the integration with Moonbeam? Is it um, like very useful because Moonbeam is EVM compatible uh, too? Yeah, so the thing about like um, Polkadot and Cosmos, they they can solve the solution to a certain point, but only for like chains that are like using the like Polkadot relay chain, for example. Like if you, if all the chains on there are able to interoperate with each other, they can communicate with each other. Um, but outside of that, there's like it only partially solves the solution, and for a like relatively small part of the market. There's still like um, Ethereum. We still got uh, Avalanche, Solana. Like they're all still essentially isolated. They're doing their own thing. You can't like get to and from very easily. Uh, to and from like from Ethereum to Solana or vice versa, very easily. So um, definitely, I feel like the so the integration with Moonbeam is extending the sort of interoperability of polka dot um and i feel like that, that can that's only like only a good thing um and i feel like the number of uh protocols that have been sort of um integrating with moonbeam as well it's definitely going to be like the sort of core ethereum communications like the evm compatibility like area for polka dot communications with other chains yeah, that's very exciting. And I think that's where like Nomad will come into play because we're going to see, I think SushiSwap was on like Moon River. So we're going to see these Ethereum protocols launch on Moonbeam as well. But obviously like users that are currently on Ethereum, they will want to easily go from Ethereum to Moonbeam because they're already used to the protocols that are on there. Like those are the ones they probably trust more than the new ones that launch maybe on other parachains. Yeah. So I definitely think a lot of liquidity will go there because it's 
kind of like with Polygon, we have seen it too with Polygon. People trusted it because it was kind of connected with the Ethereum ethos and uh, similar to um, Moonbeam, a lot of protocols from Ethereum launched on Polygon as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely important that there's a good way of bridging because that was an issue for Polygon for a long time too. At the start of 2021, it was very hard to bridge. To that. Yeah, and I mean, like, if we're going to onboard, like, uh, if, like in terms of adoption, if we're going to onboard, like, millions, hundreds of millions of people, the user experience needs to be as easy as it is um, in TradFi. And I feel like the, the whole crypto space has a problem with user experience, like, not so much the people who have already interacted with the protocols, but for people who are, like, looking to onboard uh, into crypto. Um, and I feel like um, Polkadot is quite lacking in user experience at the moment, but that's partly because a lot of the parachains are still in their launch phase. Um, but also, like, there's not really a sort of usable wallet, like Phantom kind of thing for Polkadot. Um, but like things like making it easier to get their assets from other chains to Polkadot definitely is like a step in the right direction. And that's exactly what Nomad's doing by bridging with Moonbeam. Yep. And, and I'm pretty bullish on Polkadot. Uh, I think like Polkadot as well as Cosmos were uh, ecosystems that were thinking about interoperability before anybody else was in 2017, 2018, right? So it is a testament to how ahead of the curve they were. But of course, Ethereum has like uh, network effects because it was the first kind of thing. It was the first mover that got a lot of liquidity and developer attention. And so I think about it as like... Um, the lingua franca, the thing that is adopted, like the English language, it is adopted by everybody, even though it's not the most perfect language. And if you want to do business with the English speaking world, you need a port of entry. Like if, if you're thinking about China, the port of entry used to be Hong Kong, right? Hong Kong was like this special administrative region where business was often done in English. And it had a lot of like Commonwealth tradition from the longtime UK rule. And so this was like a, a fantastic place for all these banks and you know companies to set up shop as a way to now having a gateway to the Pacific. And so the way I think about Moonbeam is the same port of entry or almost on-ramp to Polkadot that allows people to speak the language that they already know, meaning Solidity, meaning sending USDC, sending WBTC, all the assets that they have. To your point, Eugene, being able to use MetaMask, that goes a much longer way than people building the infrastructure often realize. But that developer and user experience matters a lot. But I think the promise of this is once that liquidity and developer attention and blue chip DeFi projects move over to Moonbeam, that will galvanize the entire Polkadot ecosystem. Because from Moonbeam to, for example, Manta, which is a privacy parachain, you can use XCM. You can use the native interoperability protocol of Polkadot itself to then travel to every other parachain. So this is like if you've landed in uh, Hong Kong, you can then you're part of the Bay Area now and you can go to Shenzhen or anywhere else pretty easily. Yeah, that makes and, a lot uh, of sense. And I'm like seeing the same with uh, Milko Media too. I think they're trying to do it with a bunch of other chains like uh, Algorand, uh, Cardano, uh, Solana. Uh, for me, like Solana is the most interesting one because that's like the one I personally have used of those three like a lot because there's like a lot of liquidity and a lot of traction there. So I think that would be a huge step for Nomad too to be able to help uh, communicate Ethereum with Solana by using Milkomida as the kind of Hong Kong of that uh, area. I love it. I, I hope people catch on to using Hong Kong as parlance for port of entry <laughs> chain to different ecosystems. <laughs> so I think in, in addition to Milkomida, I think Milkomida's uh, Nico and, and team there are fantastic. There's also another team I want to shout out for Solana, which is the Neon team. So Neon Labs is building... Uh, like a native Solana, uh, EVM runtime for Solana. And we're in discussions with, with that team about using Nomad as well. So big fan of those folks. And I think there's a lot of these port of entry chains that are high quality that will then tap a much larger ecosystem. And that's a big part of our strategy as well is to be able to bridge not only Ethereum to these port of entry chains, but bridging the port of entry chains from one to the other. So being able to have Moonbeam and Evmos be able to talk to each other now that's amazing. You have Cosmos and Polkadot shaking hands, which is I love. I love to see more yeah. commerce. Yeah, for sure. And um, another one I was wondering about is Near. Like, is that also a chain you are looking at yourself? Because um, it's quite like uh, new compared to uh, some of the others, like in terms of traction. But I think it's also yep. one of the chains that is trying to build 
in a similar manner, right? Like with uh, sharding and different chains communicating with each other. Yeah. So the near team is excellent. They, I think they've been building really robust systems for a long time and, and have not like um, gotten the amount of attention or credit that they deserve for the quality of stuff that they've built. Uh, I think one of the promising projects on near is Aurora. Aurora is similar to Neon in this idea that it is an EVM layer that is allows you to talk directly with Nier. And so um, we, we are excited about working with them as well and adding Nomad when the time comes. But I think one of the challenges is Nier already has an excellent bridge called the Rainbow Bridge. And so part of what we would need to figure out is how do we deal with the liquidity fragmentation issue that comes from having multiple bridges? So if we can get past that threshold, then it's a no-brainer in my mind to work with that amazing ecosystem. Yeah, it makes also way more sense to first look at places where the issue is not solved perfectly yet and try uh, competing with someone who is doing their job, you know? Exactly. Um, so yeah, uh, Eugene, do you have any comments on like the, the integrations or uh, do you think that's it? Yeah, I mean, like obviously like we're all, we're all aware of the problem. The problem is sort of liquidity fragmentation and lack of communications between chains. So the more chains that, and like the more sort of um, chains and protocols that can communicate with each other, uh, it's like it can only be a good thing. Like I can often compare it to, um, like in the sort of traditional finance world, like where we're at right now is like each not not only each sector but each town can't communicate with each other, kind of thing. And um, so like there's no unified. It doesn't have to be a unified process, but there has to be like sort of unified liquidity. For it to be a, a full, like fully functioning economy, um, and so yeah, so the more chains that are like able to like not only chains but protocols uh, that are able to communicate with each other, um, it can only be a good thing for the sort of development and adoption of crypto as a whole. Yeah, and also like we're totally going to see more chains launch. You know, like it's not going to stop at the ones we have now. Every day there are probably people. Uh, maybe from Web2 or people who are already in crypto thinking of another type of layer one or another way to um, have a blockchain. So things like Nomad will probably also keep on uh, having to integrate new parts of the industry. So that's also going to be like a very exciting job, I think, for Bridges to keep innovating and uh, keeping up with the trends. Where are people going? Where do they want to trade? And making sure those connections uh, are there for them. Exactly. And I think this is where the property of like being extensible matters, because if it takes a long time to deploy somewhere, then people want to go to these places and they will find a way. And you just don't want that way to be a multi-sig bridge, right? You want to use a robust system while we're waiting for the best and perfect system to eventually be deployed. Yeah, that's great because that's like the main issue. People don't really care or maybe they do care but they just simply don't know what they're using so yeah there's so many of these examples where people just think okay this is the easiest way to do it so i don't really need to know how it works i'll just try it out and uh, as long as it brings my assets from that chain to that chain it's fine yeah and i mean it exactly. at the end of the day like it's still like crypto is still fairly new so it's like um People expect things to work the same as they do in traditional finance, and it's just not at that stage yet. I believe, like the core sort of infrastructure is there. We've got DeFi up and running, and um, like I, I genuinely think, like one of the final missing pieces is like uh, over and above user experience, um, is like the communications between um, existing economies because like we've got, we've got these productive, um, we've got these productive chains, uh, but they're like the sort of the roadblock between um like now and becoming more productive is the lack of liquidity on a certain chain because they can't access any liquidity on other chains for example and um, so basically like none of right. these fun, none of these chains can attract liquidity without first inputting that liquidity from other places kind of thing yeah and i i want to i want to double click on this a little bit because i think it's such a valid insight because the re the I, I bring this up a lot and people who have talked to me, I apologize for beating a dead horse here, but there's this really good article by Union Square Ventures called Myth of the Infrastructure Phase that talks about how technology progresses. And I'll, I'll let you all read it at your own uh, le leisure. But 
basically um, technology improves in this like one two hop between infrastructure and applications. The infrastructure gets deployed, then applications get built that test the ability of the infrastructure and push it to its limits, calling forth another wave of in- infrastructure that solves the problems that were discovered by the applications. And to your point, Eugene, the last infrastructure phase was deploying and getting all of these amazing L1s built, but now all of the liquidity and apps on them are fragmented. If you're sushi swap, you're deploying separately on every single layer one chain and being like, now our capital efficiency is crushed because we have to split split capital across all these different deployments. So the next infra phase is figuring out how do we securely unite and allow these different execution environments to communicate effectively, safely, and in a way that that m- it makes users feel that everything under the hood is working seamless without them having to think through the security model, right? Imagine if using the internet, you had to like freak out every time you typed in a new URL because the TCP or communications protocol used was not secure. It, in fact, it, it was like that until we added like uh, SSL certs, everybody was using HTTP and you could potentially like get into issues if you landed on a on a bad website, right? And so we're in the same place where we're trying to standardize and improve the security of comms quietly and silently so that users don't have to think about what they need to do in order to just use the damn application. Yeah. Um, um, and, sorry, and, sorry, I go. It's a long spiel. I'll just quickly end it with one point, which is that this is why we partner with Connext because for for users, they want a really fast experience. They don't want to wait 30 minutes for Nomad uh, all the time, right? Some users just want instant liquidity. We don't want them to have to figure out what security model to use, whether to use Nomad or another bridge and then lock and mint their own tokens. We just want them to use high quality representational assets via Connext. And so that's where this idea of this modular stack comes in, where at the lowest layer, you have this infra that is secure, and then you have layers on top that are more and more progressively consumer facing so that users don't have to think and reason about security models because that's if they have to, we'll never become world scale as an industry. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned Connects because I want to uh, ask a question about that myself as well. Like the partnership is mainly to um, for like user experience, it seems. But how did you like uh, get in touch with them and what was like the experience like? And how do you think they will benefit Nomad more than you just mentioned? Like what are the main benefits except that? And also maybe a bit about their, their product, but because maybe not everyone knows Connext. Yeah, so I won't I won't spoil the the details of Connext. I think you should have uh, Arjun or Lane or somebody on another call and they can go into the details. It's it's more content for your viewers as well. So I think that's win win. Um, in terms of why we're working with them, um, I think there's a lot of really great liquidity network protocols in this space, but the Connects team has been building uh, in Ethereum for, I think, over five years now. Um, they were initially L2 researchers and focused on the scalability issue and then moved over to thinking about interoperability as that next incarnation of scalability challenges, much like what I was talking about, the infrastructure cycles. They saw the previous infrastructure cycle, and now they're very well equipped to reason about the trade-offs that are happening in this one. And so we very much value working with them because they also are similar in spirit. They're not trying to find a quick route to like monetary you know, windfalls. Instead, they're working hard diligently to build the most secure systems. And we want to be aligned with the partner like that. So it's just been a natural fit. I think if you have them on the show, you will, you will get a sense of what I'm saying as well. Yeah, definitely. And it's good that you mentioned them. I'll definitely put some articles from Connect down below so people can read up on it. I'm seeing we're getting very close to the end. So to uh, get to an end, I want to know where do you think a nomad is heading in like the coming years? And what are some of the things users can expect in the coming months? Great question. Um, I don't know about the coming years because there's a joke, right? Each each year in crypto, we age like dogs. So every every human year is seven crypto dog years. And so... If you're asking me to make a two-year bet, I don't think I can get a 14-year bet correctly. Um, that said, what we what we want to see in the coming months is we're just um, focused entirely on expanding to more chains. 
um, giving more options for good and secure bridging to our users, working with great partners like the Layer 1 teams we mentioned, like Connext, and working with other great app partners who, who want to integrate a secure bridging solution. That's all very clear and gives us a fairly straightforward three to six month roadmap. In the longer term, I think where the industry is moving is beyond just bridging tokens. It's moving to uh, generalized message passing where you can call contracts between different chains and send arbitrary, uh, arbitrary packets, right? And so we want to lean more into those use cases as well where a developer can come, they can use the Nomad SDK to build a natively cross-chain application. Um, we call it Zap for short because we think that's a cute name. Um, so I think more and more people will start building Zaps but we have a long way to go to improve the documentation, the SDK. But if there are other developers and folks that are interested in being at the like frontier of a natively interchain experience, please reach out to us, hit us up in on Twitter, Discord. You can find us on Telegram. We'd love to jam on this because this is like, we're not deciding what happens. We are co-creating a vision with other people that care about building a very secure and censorship resistant long-term future. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about that. And if you're listening, you should definitely like read all the articles Nomad has written. They have some very dope tweets as well about like misconceptions in bridging and uh, the way how bridges work in like very simple and short tweets. But to also uh, give the members some more, uh, Eugene, what are you uh, going to publish for our Cryptonary members in like the coming weeks? What, they, what can they expect on cross-chain comps? Yeah, so basically we've got the podcasts, um, we've got the report series starting uh, this week um, and we'll go through basically multi-chain thesis, the problem, some of the solutions and then we'll do like a thesis at the end on um, what, we, what we see, like what we sort of not anticipate to happen like going forward. Uh, but as Prani said, there's not really a way to tell the future, it'll just be sort of uh, educated guess. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. I have a... And um, Prene, just to also help them with finding Nomad, where can they find you and Nomad, uh, Discord and Twitter, I guess? Yeah, exactly. I think uh, on Twitter, the handle is Nomad XYZ underscore. Um, we had to like figure out which permutation was still available. So forgive me if I got <laughs> that wrong. Uh, and then mine is just my first name, last name um, in yeah. Twitter. So Hopefully, if there are show notes, I can send it over to y'all. But yeah, yeah hit me I'll, up. I'll put everything in the show notes. Don't worry. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. Right. So thanks. Thanks thanks again, guys, for having me on. This was Yeah, fun. no, it was a pleasure. Thank you for uh, joining us. Yeah, I, I learned a lot about Nomad and like cross-chain comms in general. And I think it was also really helpful for our thesis, like as Cryptonary, because uh, you know a lot about the topic. And it's always nice to uh, pick people's brains that are like, very focused on one sector because we are uh, going from one sector to another, but you basically keep focusing on this specific problem. And it's always just awesome hearing uh, the thoughts of those people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I love the work y'all are doing. I'm excited to read the thesis once it's yeah. out. Take care. For sure. Friend. And uh, thanks for listening, guys. Make sure to check out our next episode with Layer Zero as well. We're going to talk about uh, the Stargate Bridge. So that's going to be an interesting discussion too. And I think it's really uh, nice we can compare all those solutions uh, after all the three episodes are live. Cheers. But of course, it's not financial advice.